Yeah, so we've moved a little bit from dealing with the stress and the nerves to just kind of changing the momentum of the match as well by either arguing with a ref or, or smashing rackets or something like that. So, what I mean, what for, for a recreational player... Who's they don't want to do that. Yeah, who's, who's not going to smash uh, five rackets for a number of reasons. Um, uh, what would you recommend as a good way to break bad momentum? Do you go take a bathroom break? Do you... Uh, well, I mean... Most of the time, you don't want to go in a bathroom break if you don't want to go. Um, sure. What you do need to do, have you, you have to have a clear plan. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time, we always go for plan A and plan B. Yeah. Now, what does it consist of? You do have to know that if you're playing like everybody else knows when you go on court, sometimes you're just you know, not able to remember all that you know. Sure. So you have to have, at a max, three points. And preferably that you have two weaknesses and one strength of your opponent. Okay, so you walk in, you say you want to identify two weaknesses and one strength. This is like yes. sort of the thought process. Three points right there. Okay. Three points. And, and, and you then, according to those three points, you do have to have a strategy. Okay. You do have to have a plan. And if plan A doesn't work, plan B has to kick in. So how, okay, so let's say we've got, let's, let's say we have a, 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 let's just make up a player. Weak backhand, weak second serve. Good forehand. It's pretty straightforward. So, you know, what would the plan A be? Maybe it would be obviously attack the second serve and maybe drive the second serve at the backhand. You normally would think so, even though they have a strength, which mm -hmm. is a forehand. A lot of people then avoid that strength. Avoid it, okay. But you shouldn't. You should actually go to that strength first mm -hmm. to open up. To open it up. Okay. The weakness. So it's almost for to, to use an example of a of a of a rivalry that's that's very um, relevant right now would be uh, Novak Djokovic taking backhands cross court at Rafa's forehand, then open up Rafa's backhand side. That's right. Something like that. Something okay. like that. So okay, there you go. Something there you like go. that. That's exactly right. <laughs> and you know, even if they have a second serve that it's weak, mm -hmm. resist the temptation of going for too much. Okay. Now we all know about get errors. Excited, yeah. We all know about unforced errors, we also know about winners. But the winners are not measured by speed. Mm -hmm. It's by just that the ball doesn't get back to Come you. Back. Okay. So it's outplacing your opponent, not by power, mm -hmm. not by speed, but by outplacing, outmaneuvering your opponent. So a second serve, a weak second serve, it's very tempting to go for that big, big return. Blast it. But why don't you just set yourself up for the next shot? instead of going for that first shot. So that's another clear plan to have when you have that second weak, weak serve. So you don't rip that, that easy second serve. It's, it's getting the, you know, I think this is important, especially for the rec player who, you watch pro tennis and see these guys hit these huge shots and you immediately get enamored with the power. You know, oh, I want to hit a million miles an hour and hit this winner. When it's actually, like you just said, get the player out of position and then that's when you get the winners. There's a ton of open court to work with, and then you just hit an okay shot over there. It's nothing special. That's right. It doesn't come back as the come... winner. Yep, exactly. Okay. So so off that second serve, where do you, you know, if, if it's a weak second serve and you're not trying to just rip the ball, what do you normally advise there? Sometimes you would go at the strength. Sometimes you go at the weakness. Would it be more going for an angle to pull someone off a court, or does it really just depend on the opponent? Uh, obviously, it depends on the opponent every yeah. time, but if you say, for example, have your personal strength, yeah. obviously, if your forehand is better and you have a second serve that is weak, mm -hmm. you start looking for your inside-out forehand. Okay. You start looking for your forehand more. What it also does, if you start looking for your forehand more often, it automatically creates, creates a more offensive game mm -hmm. because you create movement. A lot of times, people just wait for that ball to get to them, but if they start looking for that inside out forehand right away you create that movement around the ball you set yourself up and movement creates your position position creates opening with that gives you opportunity so when you have a little bit so basically what you're saying when you have a little bit of a game plan and you're looking for y your strength you know at the rec level it's, it's very much reactionary the ball comes to you and then you kind of react to what's going on versus anticipating and setting yourself up to hit that shot that's right that's why i want to know about the strength and the weakness and of the your weakness. opponent. Okay. So then you can have a clear plan what you mm -hmm. were going to do. Now, in that match progress, if you are knowing those three points, you'll also see that they have a favorite pattern. 
do they always go cross court on yep. that back end or do they actually prefer to go to the center of the court do they go down the line mm -hmm. when do they go to the line these are little things that you can make your assessments and if they have a weaker back net back end make them hit that back and return yep. and then go back to that strength again to open up the weak side so the the starting point again three points pretty simple two weaknesses one strength you start to gain it by, by starting with that you start to gain uh, sort of other information on uh, on your opponent. Sort of the simple framework to start leads to more information that you kind of gather um, and, and will become aware of, I guess you could say, just because you had that that sort of starting point right there. That's okay. right. And that's a lot of times it's lost yeah. when you are losing, you're not playing your best tennis, mm. and that's why you have to have that plan yeah. B. That plan B is playing up to your strength. Not only worry about your opponents, start playing your strengths, start looking for mm. your game, look for that bigger shot, look for your inside forehand, start moving. Mm -hmm. Get that movement going yeah. and try to really change up the game. And it's and it's 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 also instructive, you don't have to have all the information at the start of the match. No. You got those three points, you figure that out and then you kind of figure it out as you go. Yeah, it may, it may be so yeah. that they actually have prepared, they have done their homework. Mm -hmm. They've watched uh, also uh, our little video there and they say, yeah, wait exactly. a second, you know, we <laughs> need those three points. Their, uh, yeah. And they pull it <laughs> up and they say, you know, I'm prepared. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden their strategy has changed. Yep. Now you have to adapt. Yep. And adaptability is obviously needed when the score is also one of the uh, aspects that may go against you. Mm. So adapt your plan. So you, you alluded a little bit to um, just tennis stats, we're talking about the winners, that's the one stat everybody focuses on, but uh, you know, what other stats do you focus on as a, uh, as a professional coach and what do you think as, as, as a recreational player or a, uh, uh, a teaching pro are some important stats other than the winners that are pretty straightforward? Of course, on Forceros would be important as well. Well, in my opinion, and that, that doesn't mean much, but it's my opinion. Well, it, and, it, uh, it, mean, I, it, mean, it means a little bit, it means a little bit. I look, I look at the surf. <laughs> Okay. Obviously, I look at the serve direction uh, a lot. I look at the serve percentage. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't always mean when you have a low first serve percentage, it doesn't always mean that it's done to um, put pressure on your opponent. It may mean that you feel the stress and you feel the stress yeah. from your opponent putting extra pressure on that second serve, yeah. so you're going for more. It's also about the location of the surf. Um, over time, I've worked with Greg Rosetsky mm -hmm. and I've done my analysis and I had five, ga five matches of Pete Sampras. They were playing the final of the Bercy Open and uh, I prepared a little stats for Greg Rosetsky and I said, okay, Greg, I've done five matches of, of Pete mm -hmm. and Pete is gonna surf on 15.30 out of all those five matches. <laughs> In general, he's gonna go with a big surf out wide. It yep. doesn't matter if he's playing a righty or a lefty, he he's going to go it, for yeah. his favorite serve. Mm -hmm. Now if you know that and you have that in your pocket and you know that it's going to happen on those break points, mm -hmm. when you do have that break point, it may just change the match. Yeah. And he won that match based on no, did he? that stat. That one stat? That's interesting. Uh, the uh, same stat, I must add, was very interesting with Venus Williams uh -huh. and Anna Ivanovic doing her stats, looking at her lo service location, mm -hmm. knowing that Venus Williams doesn't have a good kick out wide mm -hmm. on the ad side. We could locate it, we could see it, we analyzed it, we looked at all yeah. the matches. Anna was hitting inside out forehands. The whole time, the whole she time. knew she, she could knew get She knew that she it, was yeah. not gonna go back yeah. to that back inside. Very, very interesting. You know, there's, a, there's a, some of you might, might have heard Bob and Mike Ryan say this. They, they are very big into stats as well and kind of understanding the particulars of, uh, of their opponents and uh, player. Uh, you're obviously familiar with uh, Leander Pays, a uh, fantastic doubles player, just actually beat Bob and Mike at, at the Aussie, but a uh, big point poacher. Almost always poaches on big points, so Bob and Mike knew that and kind of kept that information in their back pocket, and then a couple years ago at the Aussie, on a big point, I, I believe it was Bob went line anticipating the poach, won, won a point, I think set up a break point or something like that, That's and, right. and won the match. So those little p pieces of information and and little uh, 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 you know sort of statistical advantages if you if you can uh, if you can gain them at uh, at the club level, at uh, at the junior level, and whatnot, make a make a big uh, a big difference there. Um, 
one thing that that uh, uh, I think is quite important. Um, have you ever, out of curiosity, tried Pilates? Sort of as a tan tangent. I've been st I've been doing it recently. I've not. I've seen it many of times. Yeah. And many players have have done so. And I, I've started doing it. It's fantastic. Very good for for flexibility and whatnot. Um, and it's 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 actually helped me with some injuries um, on the tennis court. So I want to talk a little bit about something related to that uh, warming up properly. Mm -hmm. um, you you know, there's a field over there where the players kind of run around in circles. They kick around a soccer ball. You, you know, what do you think is important from a warm up perspective? What uh, obviously you know you can just generically say, well, you can get loose. But are there any specific exercises maybe you like? Um, or a specific things you focus on when you're trying to get warmed up, get your player warmed up before a match? Well, obviously all players have different routines. Yeah. Um, what you see here on the field, these players are not only doing a warm-up, they're also actually, it's a pre-practice preparation. Right. That's, why, but that's how I call it. It's a pre-practice pre preparation. The three, the three Ps. The three Ps, all right. Because it's no longer a warm-up. Mm -hmm. It's turned into actually a, a maintenance of your body it's a prevention of injuries okay. and it's actually also training those joints and those tendons to just to be loose and flexible. Right. That's in part that I, I, I encourage mm -hmm. most of the players. Now from a recreational point of view, um, there are a lot of um, different opinions about, about, about the warm-up, about stretching. Obviously when you walk on the court you must have your body at a certain sure. level of, of, of uh, readiness. Mm -hmm. um, heart rate up. Yep. Jumping rope, jumping jump rope, good. jump rope is one of the best ways of warming up. Huh? Okay. Because I mean, if you look at it, you get your heart rate up. Yeah, heart rate. You're on your toes. That's what you need to be yeah. on tennis. You got your shoulders. You got your wrists going. So, hmm. jump rope. Okay. By far the most accurate, okay. most precise, and most specific way of warming up for tennis is is very very good. Okay. Okay. So jump rope. That's a good one. All right, so Sven, why don't we talk, uh, you know, specifically about uh, about being a high-level coach? Because I know a lot of people watching uh, watching this video, um, not only aspiring players but aspiring uh, coaches as well, and uh, and would certainly love to hear from one of the best coaches in the world, sort of what it takes to, you know, they might not necessarily want to be a, a you know a pro coach, but they obviously want to be a good coach. So why don't we start, you know? What, what do you think are, are sort of some of the do's and don'ts uh, of just being a, a high quality coach? Just sort of a broad general question there. Um, to have that as a broad question, I think it's very important as a coach, you have to listen. Mm -hmm. All right. um, we all have this, this idea that the definition of a coach is that we deliver uh, a certain message, information, we're there to teach, uh, we were there to enrich people but we can only enrich them with knowledge that they may not have if we know them. So I encourage always, every player that I've, I've started working with, I always sit, with, sit down with them. Mm -hmm. I get to talk with them, I get to know them, I go to dinner with them. Yeah. Now you don't want to do that with every recreational sure. player, but if you, you say, if you go into professional coaching, make sure that you know who you're talking to. Yeah. Know their history, know their strengths, know their weakness, and in a broad sense, you have to really be ready just to absorb more than you give. All right, so that's that's quite interesting. I mean, that, that would, I think for a lot of people, seem like the exact opposite. We're right. always giving, you know, do this, do this, do this, but it's actually a conversation, and it's almost a conversation where you do less of the talking. That's right. And the player does more, and then you just figure out, you know, it's kind of the, the whole signal, the noise thing you want to be sending out signals and not be sending out too much noise. That's right. All That's right. So. You want to be very clear about your message. Yep. At the same time, you want to be open for anything that comes to you. Yeah. So you do have to have an open mind. Mm -hmm. 